Recently, on The Basement Office, investigative reporter Tim McMillan told host Stephen Greenstreet the following, which he heard from a veteran source inside the Intel and aerospace world. Um, they alluded to the fact that they weren't flying saucers, they weren't Tic Tacs, that they were something that possessed the ability to kind of make your mind see what makes sense to you. And so, um, Whatever it was didn't look like a flying saucer. In 2018, The Mind Sublime came across a slideshow on the website of Chris Mellon, former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Intelligence and advisor for Tom DeLonge's To The Stars Academy. Now deleted, the slides concerned ATIP, the Advanced Aerospace Threat and Identification Program, a DOD study of unexplained aerial phenomena. They claim, the science exists for an enemy of the United States to manipulate both physical and cognitive environments in order to penetrate U.S. facilities, influence decision makers, and compromise national security. So what does this have to do with DeLong's recent description of a control mechanism so different than what we would ever conclude? Don't assume they are coming from other planets. This is also where the conversation gets disturbing, he added. And does this tie into findings from scientist Jacques Vallée? We cover unique declassified files. Subscribe to join us. March 6, 1716, Northumberland, England. A hearse carrying the Earl of Derwentwater arrives at Dilston Castle for burial. That night, a family servant reports seeing a great light seen in several places for 30 minutes. The Historical Register in London reports several saw a huge curtain of light across the sky. It started to move in a random fashion and dissolve into parts, heading west and changing into large pillars of flame. In Oxford, locals saw cavalry fighting in the sky, and some near Liverpool reported seeing heavenly armies and smelled gunpowder. Astronomer Edmund Haley could not find an explanation either. He wrote it was a phenomenon that might well be taken to resemble the conflicts of men in battle. Haley reported cones and cylinder-shaped objects that reminded some of battlements and towers. Could this have a less exotic explanation? Perhaps. A professor from Copenhagen chronicled Aurora Borealis, or Northern Lights, a few days later. Though that doesn't explain why Haley arguably the most trained observer in his country, reported seeing cone-shaped objects, or why others saw headless men with flaming swords. Are there other observations of strange phenomena fitting the era they're seen in? April 11, 1897. Residents of Benton Harbor and St. Joseph, Michigan report seeing an airship above Lake Michigan for 15 minutes. The craft has red, green, and blue flashing lights. Twenty others see a ship emitting sparks before it slowly settles near the ground. Voices are heard inside. After a few moments, the machine rises slowly, turns off its lights, and disappears into the night. Near Kalamazoo, fragments of unknown material are found after an object is observed exploding in midair, and a wheel falls off another onto a farm in Battle Creek. That same week, the St. Louis Post-Dispatch published this account. An elderly businessman deemed reliable by his friends, W.H. Hopkins, claims to see an aluminum airship sitting on four legs with two propellers. Near the craft is, quote, the most beautiful being he's ever seen, a woman with golden hair speaking a language he can't understand, with a voice like low, silvery bells, and a man with long auburn hair and a full beard. As Hopkins walks toward them, he extends his hand in welcome. The bearded man looked at it a moment, astonishment depicted in his dark brown eyes, and finally he extended his own and touched mine, he later wrote. Hopkins attempts to kiss the woman's hand. The color rose to her cheeks and she drew it hastily away. Hopkins claims he is brought inside the ship, which contains a luxurious couch made of materials he's never seen, and a series of metallic balls suspended from the ceiling. The bearded man struck one, and it began to vibrate and illuminate a soft white light. 
He knocked on two others near the propellers, which began to revolve rapidly, and the craft started to take off. Hopkins writes, I sprang out and none too soon, for the vessel rose as lightly as a bird and shot away like an arrow, and in a few minutes was out of sight. The two stood laughing and waving their hands to me, she a vision of loveliness and he of manly vigor. By the end of 1897, sightings had come in from California and Texas in addition to the Midwest. Could the Phantom airships simply have been covert tests? A rigid airship design had been patented by Ferdinand von Zeppelin two years earlier, and he did begin construction of a Zeppelin with tail fins and rudders in Germany by 1898, flying its first flight in 1900. But that explanation gets us no closer to understanding Hopkins' strange encounter. And curiously, the questions themselves have a lot in common with what ufologists ask today. If Macmillan's source is correct, and the phenomenon can appear in a way that makes sense to the observer, then perhaps that explains why perceptions of anomalous encounters change over time. And if A-TIP's conclusions are correct, and the phenomenon can manipulate both physical and cognitive environments, then perhaps ufology has been too close-minded. Modern UFO lore does have cases that fit this hypothesis. October 1965. A radio DJ in Long Prairie, Minnesota is driving along a country road when he sees an upright, rocket-shaped object on the shoulder. It is 30 to 40 feet high and resting on fins. My car engine, lights, and radio went out as I slammed on the brakes, he said in a report later obtained by the Air Force's Project Blue Book. He got out and was approached by three creatures who came from behind the rocket. They looked like individual tin cans on tripods and were about six inches tall. They didn't have eyes, but I knew they were looking at me. I stopped. I didn't have any desire to get closer. There was no sound, just dead silence. It seemed like ages we looked at each other. Then they went up into the rocket, which had a bright colorless light glowing out of the bottom. After a loud hum, the rocket took off, and his car radio, lights, and engine went on without having to touch the starter. The sighting was reported to the local sheriff, who deemed the witness reliable. Three hunters in the area also reported seeing a strange light in the sky at the same time the witness said the rocket took off. Blue Book concluded Venus may have triggered the incident and that psychological factors contributed to the sentient tin cans. But was Blue Book just not looking wide enough at the issue here? Instead of throwing out all the psychological cases, should they instead have sent them to a sort of anomalous phenomenologist familiar with the history we've discussed? One trailblazer in this line of thinking is Jacques Vallée. A protege to J. Allen Hynek at Northwestern University, Vallée concluded by the late 1960s the extraterrestrial hypothesis was too narrow in 75, he published The Invisible College, in which he examines the hypothesis of UFOs as a control system. That they are not necessarily caused by extraterrestrial visitors, nor the result of misidentifications and hoaxes on the part of deluded witnesses. If the hypothesis is true, then what the witnesses have seen were manifestations of a process not unlike that of a thermostat in a house. The thermostat is a mechanism that stabilizes the relationship between our body temperature requirements and the changing weather outside. Similarly, UFOs may serve to stabilize the relationship between man's consciousness needs and the evolving complexities of the world which he must understand. Valet later clarifies, When I speak of a control system, I do not want my words to be misunderstood. I do not mean that some higher order of beings has locked us inside the constraints of a space-bound jail, closely monitored by psychic entities we might call angels or demons. I do not propose to redefine God. What I do mean is that mythology rules at a level of our social reality over which normal political and intellectual action has no real power. 
Myths define the set of things scholars, politicians, and scientists can think about. Many questions remain, though. Under this hypothesis, is this thermostat of anomalous phenomena a creation of human consciousness? Does it need support from a collective consciousness to form? Or is it separate from humanity altogether? And if it is, is it from Earth? Or not? Asking these questions another way. Do UFOs appear to witnesses as flying saucers and spacecraft because humankind itself is pondering a future in the stars? Or is the phenomenon trying to prepare us for that future? Of course, thinking about the phenomenon in this light is much less comfortable than accepting the ET hypothesis. But no one ever said there would be an easy answer to this. And perhaps this is the disturbing conversation DeLong is referring to. If the control system hypothesis is correct, depending on how deep in history it has operated, it may be responsible for events that were the genesis of some religious movements. The Shepherd of Hermas was a valued literary work in several Christian faiths for centuries. In it, the alleged brother of Pope Pius I claims to have seen a beast with a surface like pottery land in a cloud of dust. Stepping out of it was a woman dressed in all white with white hair. She told the witness to tell others to repent unto the Lord and to serve him for the rest of their lives. She warned of a great tribulation to come that could only be alleviated by faith. That's just one example. But you can probably imagine the controversy if one overarching phenomenon is responsible for all close encounters throughout human history. What do you think? Let us know in the comments. And remember, this is just one hypothesis. There are others, and they are all worth debate. Special thanks to our patrons, including Nikolai I. If you like what we do, consider joining them on Patreon and help us produce one new episode a week. Most of our traffic comes from external shares, so if you have any family or friends interested, we'd appreciate it if you ask them to subscribe. Thank you again. See you next time.